the final writing assignment uh, right now, uh, which is due uh, December 9th at 11.55 p.m. You're posting your responses to Moodle. Um, it's a uh, 1,000 to uh, 1,250 word reflection paper directed towards um, these course overview questions, which I've decisively left uh, sort of general with the full expectation that you guys are going to refine them to reflect what you're interested in or concerned about with regard to the material that we've studied. Um, you're to pick no less than two theorists uh, for these questions as well. So um, any of the two of the six that we've studied, any two of those uh, would be would be permissible. Um, and you're also uh, posting um, by December 5th a response to the Reading Project proposal form as well. That's that's also worth 5% of your final grade. I passed that, uh, I grade that on a pass fail basis. And what I'm looking for is a substantial um, response. I mean, I've had them in the past where I plan to answer question one using these two theorists. Thank you, I'm out. Mic drop. Right now, um, unfortunately, that's that's not a substantial plan for writing your paper. I, I, I'm interested in question one because blah blah blah. Right, I'm using these theorists because I think theorist one is apt, and I heavily disagree with the second theorist. So I'm going to construct my argument this way. And that might be a sufficient response. Um, so basically, do that. Uh, it's all or nothing on that, and um, I'm actually not looking for a lot. The reason I have that come in early is because um, I want you thinking in advance about this writing project and not just doing it sort of the day before. So um, these are coming in fairly soon. Uh, let me see. Um, ba -doo -boo -boo. Um, the questions, like I say, they're very general. Um, the first one has to do on what basis should we make a normative claim or a should or should not claim. Right. Now, each and every one of the theorists that we've studied in this course has um, presented you with a way of making a normative claim. Right. From Socrates, it's going to be based on a sort of critical reasoning and um, a certain degree of sincerity. Right. Should we claim that we know things when we do not? Should we act like we know things when we do not? Right. So uh, with Aristotle, um, his normative claims are all centered around that linchpin argument, the function argument, and directed towards uh, the development of intellectual and moral, that is, habitual virtues. Right. So his normative claims right, are all centered around that. Right? ultimately centered on a sort of teleological or end-oriented argument. This is how we best express our human capacities and reach a state of eudaimonia or happiness. Right? Now, uh, then we turn to Kant and Mill. And Emil Kant is a little bit more direct, I tend to think, about basing a normative claim. Right? He tells us that you know, an action should be done for the sake of the moral law and gives us, well, we studied three ways of determining exactly what that moral law entails in a particular situation, the categorical imperatives. Violation of that moral law is um, a violation of reason. You're being irrational, right? If you lie when you know bloody well that either you're using people or that, um, for example, you don't actually will that everybody else lies because you're aware that the act of lying would refute itself ultimately if willed as a universal law. If it held always and everywhere that everybody should lie, the act of lying itself would become uh, purposeless. Right? So um, that's Kant. Right? John Stuart Mill, how do we base a um, normative claim? Pleasure, pain, greatest good, greatest number. Right? He's got some caveats in there, some important ones. Right? Uh, one, there's a principle of harm and a treatment of liberty. And then two, um, there is that distinction between you know, the higher and lower order pleasure. Right? But nonetheless, right, it is a fairly straightforward moral theory. And then our final two theorists, with Nietzsche, 
Um, and uh, what one of your um, final test questions meant to bring out is really, um, this is the second question on Nietzsche, it's not a true or a false, it's not a rational analysis that we are performing, but rather um, he tells us, um, right on your page seven of Beyond Good and Evil, we do not object to a judgment because it's false. This is probably what's strangest about our new language. The question is rather, to what extent the judgment furthers life, preserves life, preserves the species, perhaps even cultivates the species, and we are in principle inclined to claim that judgments are the uh, which are the most false are the most indispensable to us, that man could not live without accepting logical fictions, etc., etc., etc. So really what Nietzsche is arguing is that a should claim is going to be based on a theme of health, right? You should hold positions, you should do actions, you should um, dispose yourself to the world in a way that promotes health and vitality and the affirmation of life, right? Bad positions, those which are prohibited, turn hostily against life, against the instincts, right? So effectively, that's the way we make a normative claim in Nietzsche. And then ultimately in Sartre, and I laid this out in both the video and um, if you were in class in class as well, um, uh, the, the, um, the basis for normative claim, well, there are two ways to actually judge right, that we concluded our analysis of Sartre with. Right? One is perhaps not a normative judgment, but rather a logical sort of judgment insofar as some choices are based on truth, others on error. Right? But secondly, right, he lays this out quite clearly, and I'll just pull the page reference out for you. It's just after um, that um, do 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 do, -do thinger on, um, yeah, let me see. Sorry, I should have this on the top of my head here, but um, uh, shoo, doo, 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 doo. it's just after he talks about um, comparing um, ethics to art, right? Um, boo -doo -boo -boo, and it's over the page, but nonetheless, and nevertheless, page 44, he, um, <clears throat> he addresses the logical judgment, right? And um, on page 45, besides, I can bring a more moral judgment to bear. When I declare that freedom in every concrete circumstance can have no other aim than to want itself, if a man uh, has once become aware that he, in his forlornness he imposes values, he can no longer want but one thing, and that is freedom as the basis of all values. Right now, um, over the page, um, he um, he on 46 he makes this a little bit more clear. Right when he states, therefore, in the name of this will for freedom, which freedom itself implies, I may pass judgment on those who seek to hide from the complete arbitrariness and the complete freedom of their existence. Now, <clears throat> effectively. What Sartre is arguing here, I've, I've turned this and um, Elaine de Baton in the video um, that I showed you um, called bad faith, is terms this as bad faith. When we pretend that we're not free, or when we pretend like we're not responsible, or, so pertaining to anxiety, right? Or when we pret uh, pretend that there is some sort of objective moral code and our decisions are somehow necessary, right, rather than stemming from our own, as he points out in our forlornness on 45, right, do, 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 uh, stemming from our own imposition of value, right, or then finally, when we pretend, like, say, the world owes us something, right, or, like, it, it, when we pretend that we're not in despair, right? It, we are in bad faith, right? So effectively, when somebody is in bad faith, we're in a position to judge them, right? Action should be, if, if existence precedes essence, 
right? And in choosing ourselves, we choose all of mankind. And through our choosing, we define mankind from the basis of our own freedom, right? And we always choose from a concrete situation any chance to, any, any, any sort of attempt to wiggle away from the full consequences of our freedom is something that can be judged negatively. But on the other hand, right, if, for example, someone stands up for something that they believe in, right, if somebody stands up for something they believe in, realizing their full freedom and full responsibility in that context, realizing that from their will their judgment stems, and realizing that they have to take the full weight of the consequences arising from the situation that they did not choose into account, then there's a certain sense in existential ethics where we can't really judge. We can still have a conversation, but we can't judge. Right? Because really, as Sartre lays it out, right, art and ethics have something in common. We are inventing, we're creating. When we choose, when we act, we are creating values. Right? So that's each and every one of the, the sort of normative bases right, that we've studied so far in the class. And I've tried to give you sort of a well-rounded um, sort of smattering of classical and sort of postmodern theory um, with regard to how we make these kinds of choices. Right? So that's the first question. Um, the second one, given the argument studied in this course, what status does the faculty of reason have as a moral faculty? Well, for two theorists in specific, right, you might add a third in there, right, we find that reason is the be-all and the end-all of ethical sort of decision-making, right? Reason is that faculty that allows us to make a normative claim, make a decision, right? It allows us to, in a sense, curtail our desires and act on, as Kant would say, laws that we give ourselves. The first theorist who holds this position we saw is Socrates. Right? We should reason, not emote our way through decision-making. Right? This is his whole stance to the judges, the audience at his trial. Right? His whole stance had to, it had to do with the fact that I'm not going to supplicate myself to you, right? but rather what I'm going to do is make a reasoned argument and hope you follow me through to the conclusions. I speak the truth, you judge the justice of what I'm saying. Right. The second theorist that I might add to this list is Aristotle. Remember, rationality is our distinctive function. Now, Aristotle doesn't really oppose reason to the emotions, but uh, invites the emotions to the table. Right. Effectively, reason is that faculty that we use to train our desires right, so that we can develop virtues rather than vices. Uh, so always and everywhere, it's the expression of our distinctive capacity to reason. Uh, and the third theorist that I want, might point out where it is the be-all and the end-all is Kant. Kant probably has the strongest opposition between reason and desire that we find. Right? <laughs> the basis of perfect and to a certain extent imperfect duty as well is reason. Right? To a certain extent, it's, and uh, on, on, on that last test I wasn't hard on you about this, right? it's because you're right, imperfect duty stems from the will, but can I rationally consistently will that a maxim that forbids or actually requires me to be selfish rather than beneficent it become a moral law? Right? Well, there's no immediate rational contradiction, but I cannot, with rational consistency, will 
that everybody be selfish jerks rather than helpful to one another because, well, really, nobody would want to live in such a world, right? So in principle, right, a maxim that requires us all to be selfish and unhelpful to one another would be inconsistent at both the level of reason and will, right? So for Kant, reason is our ultimate faculty. He, in this respect, is probably uh, the most typical of the Enlightenment philosophers um, it, that, 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 that we could have studied in this course as a moral theorist, because the motto um, for the Enlightenment is Sapra Audi, dare to, no, dare to use your own reason, right? So those are the three, the big three, that place reason at the top of the heap. Right? Now, this is not to say the other three that we've discussed are arguing that we should be irrational, but if we think of the utilitarians, for example, reason is kind of like a calculator. It allows us to calculate pleasure and pain. Right? You know, it's ultimately the basis of a normative judgment, ultimately the moral faculty that is in play for Bentham and for Mill is, you know, our sensitivity, our capacity to experience pleasure and pain. Reason helps us anticipate the outcomes of our action and assess those outcomes in terms of whether they produce the most pleasure versus pain. Right? But nonetheless, right? Nietzsche, on the other hand, is presenting us with a dispositional sort of argument. The most important thing for Nietzsche is that we have a healthy attitude to life. Right? So reason is decentered as a moral faculty. And again, in Sartre, he's not arguing. In fact, it's in his argument. He's he's used a lot of classical philosophical reasoning. There's a reference to Bloody Descartes in here. Right? It's one of the reasons he says subjectivity should be the starting point for existential philosophy, because there can be no more sure and certain a basis for philosophy, no more rational a basis for philosophy than that sure and certain truth of our existence. Right? So he's rational, but really reason shows us the full implications of our freedom. So really it's freedom and the creative choice making, right? That is the basis for Sartian philosophy, right? So none of these theorists are suggesting we should be irrational. They just find a different place to put reason on the heap of uh, considerations that we have to take into account when we make a moral decision. So, does that make sense, I hope? Okay. And then finally, given the argument studied in this course, in what sense can we be said to be free? What does freedom mean? Uh, now, for the ancients, this is a funny one. Effectively, for both Socrates and Aristotle, we find that freedom involves reveling in the expression of our human capacities. For both of them, that's rationality. Right? It's you get a bit stricter a case that opposes reason to desire or emotion or opinion in Socrates versus Aristotle, right? Who, to a certain extent, wants to embrace our emotional landscape, but nonetheless, right, we're freest when we are most fully human, that is expressing that which is most fully human in us, that is being bloody rational. Yeah. In Kant, we find that it's that complicated treatment of freedom that we get it so well expressed by Sandel in his videos, autonomy. Right. We are autonomous, we are rational, and we are effectively legislators of universal moral law. We are beings capable right, of giving laws to ourselves. Right. That's how we get the second formulation of the categorical imperative. Why? Because we can actually 
discharge what we need to do to live by the first formulation of the categorical imperative. That's pretty bloody impressive. Uh, effectively, Mill right, has a negative conception of freedom, liberty. Right? We're free insofar as we have these liberties, when we are not impeded in our attempt to calculate the greatest good, preferably for the greatest number. Right? Though, nonetheless, we need these political liberties. He's talking about civil liberties. He's not talking about any sort of freedom of the will in an abstract sense like Kant is, or like uh, maybe Jean-Paul Sartre would, right? Because Sartre is talking about freedom as it stems from our very condition, right? It's an existential condition that we are free versus Mill, we're free insofar as we have these political liberties, these protections, right, that prevent power, specifically the power of this state, from being exercised over us. Right? Otherwise, we're just subject to this large utilitarian kind of calculation that the greatest good for the greatest number may exterminate. It, I, let me see, I'm trying to remember. In my Mill video, I, I, I gave the example of a good utilitarian doctor right, with five people in the waiting room. Four need organ transplants really bad, and the other one has you know, a minor case of the sniffles, which is now cleared up. Right? Well, if you're a good utilitarian doctor and haven't read Mill's on Liberty, well, what do you do? Well, you do what's in the interest of the greatest good for the greatest number. You might exterminate the fifth patient and spread those organs out to save the other four patients. That's the greatest good for the greatest number, isn't it? You got these four people that are going to die without these organs, and there's one person who's got the sniffles. Yeah. Now, to a certain extent, Liberty jumps in and says, wait, this person has a right to those organs. Right? In fact, what the doctor would do is in violation of the principle of harm. That's why Mill argues that politically we need these liberties. That's the sense in which we're free. Right? But otherwise, you know, it's the greatest good for the greatest number. Right? And then finally, Nietzsche. You get an interesting treatment of his conception of free will. And I asked you one question on the final test about this, um, and it is in um, section 19 of Beyond Good and Evil, where he gives the four-part breakdown of uh, the free will, right? where, you know, really he points out that the act of willing, rather than being something simple, is something very complicated, that there are several internal tensions, and think about waking up in the morning. Your alarm goes off and you go, oh, do I have to get up? And there's this battle within you. There's sensations. There's a conceptual understanding of your situation. Oh, what do I have to do today if I don't get up? I'm in big trouble because i got to get it to work, right? that sort of thing. And then there's this emotional tension within yourself right? that when you perform an act of the will, part of you commands and actually feels the, the, the superiority emotionally of the being the one commanding, right, that we associate with command, right, and identifies that part of itself as that which has commanded, so it gets to feel the pride at having commanded, but if that's the case, there's something in the human being that obeys as well, and that part actually experiences all of the emotions right, associated with that. <clears throat> he lists them off. Feelings of coercion, pressure, oppression, resistance, agitation that begin immediately after the act of the will. It's on page 19 if you're looking for it. Now, on the other hand, in section 21, he argues against pretty well the opposite concept as well. The unfree will. All right? The unfree will all right, is just as silly a concept as the free will. So he winds up arguing 
right? Um, we alone are the ones who've invented causes, succession, reciprocity, uh, <clears throat> relativity, coercion, number, law, freedom, reason, purpose. And if we project, if we mix this word of science into things as, uh, as if it were, and in itself, we act once more as we have always done. That's that is, we've acted mythologically. The unfree will is mythology. In real life, there's only a matter of strong and weak wills. Right? Insofar as the act of will is sort of a feat of strength by the analysis offered by Nietzsche, because there's something that has to overcome something else in the human being to pull it off. Right? So we're neither free in an absolute sense, nor unfree in an absolute sense, right? in Nietzsche's estimation. The will is either strong or weak. Right? And an expression of our freedom is like a feat of strength. That kind of makes sense. Right? And then, of course, in Sartre, right, we are existentially free. If existence precedes essence, we are our choices. We're nothing but our choices. We're nothing until we choose. Right? So for Sartre, it's all about freedom, but it's always a situated kind of freedom. It's a freedom that has to do all of its inventing for itself. Right? And it's always freedom within the constraints of a situation. I'm free, but I'm free in a room, in a country, with laws, and an economy, and limited capacities. And it's not as though the world bends to my will. I'm always free within a context. So for Sartre, freedom, well, our existential condition, well, it is our existential condition, is always a situated freedom. It's not an abstract freedom. It's a lived condition. So in what sense can we be said to be free, or what does freedom mean? Right. I tend to think it's for the longest time I didn't have a question about freedom on um, these 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 final writing assignment kind of things. Right, I, I was kicking myself one semester for that. I said I got to do that because ethics is nothing if we can't be said to be in some sense free. To a certain extent, an ethics course that doesn't engage freedom isn't an ethics course. It's a methodologies course. It's a procedures course. Right. So, rea realistically, it all stems from our freedom. But I've given you six different ways to really think about what that could mean. So, anyhow, that's your writing assignment. Um, it's between four and five pages. That's, that's 1,000 to um, 1,250 words, right? Um, I'm going to re uh, remind you to reference your work. I think I've got that up here. Um, I've posted a sample structure um, onto Moodle for philosophy papers. Right? So it's meant to be a suggestion. It's just what I do when I organize my thoughts. You don't have to do it. Um, zero tolerance policy on plagiarism for this course. If you're using anything, anything, like even to structure your argument or to come up with an example or anything along those lines, just throw a footnote on it. Just throw a reference on it. Right? Now, I'll know where you got it and everything's above board. Right? Otherwise, it's something that looks as though you're trying to pass somebody else's work off as yours, right? which is a big no-no. Um, and uh, if you're unsure how to properly cite, I've got the cite right thing, the online thing for its, uh, there's a reference on the uh, course syllabus, right? which if I go there right now, yeah, that's the link right there on the course syllabus. Um, what else did I want to say about that? Um, yeah, these ones I really look forward to reading. Right. It's, I, I often wish I had more time to actually talk to you about your papers or work with you on your papers, but at the end of the course is really the only place they fit. 
right? Um, it, because the, the the kind of work involved in um, uh, juggling 140 students, each writing five-page papers on something like that, is just not something that fits in a regular semester. So um, that is your writing assignment.